Hello, everybody. Welcome once again to another episode of the Remarkable Coach Podcast. As always, I am your host, Michael Pacheco. And joining me today is Ken Jensen. Ken is a former Marine who has survived one war, a handful of actual deaths, two comas, bipolar disorder, and multiple addictions. His recovery led to insights he now uses to help others create online businesses to share their survival stories. Ken Jensen, welcome to The Remarkable Coach. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for having me. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you making the time to chat with me today. Um, always with this podcast, when we've got a new guest on, I like to just invite you to speak a little bit about yourself in your own words um, and tell us why it is you do what you do. Well... Everything about me is attached one way, shape, or form to my, my, the nexus point, which was bipolar disorder. I had a really bad case of it, and I had, in my late 20s, and I had every version of it they cared to give a name to, the worst being mixed. Mixed, if they call it that still, I don't really pay much attention anymore, but mixed is when you have a bad depression fueled by the energy of mania. I can't, I, do, I don't have words for how bad that is. It's a violent depression mm -hmm. that comes at you like a physical attack. So I survived, I survived all of that. And uh, I got put in a coma once off of that from a, a lithium OD that happened while I was drunk. Drinking was a big problem coming out of the Marines, you know, saying that you're a Marine and you drink is almost a, it's too, it's too redundant. Yep. <laughs> but even in with that, I was one of the higher class achievers, unfortunately, but I learned eventually, I learned a unique outside the system way of beating bipolar. I attempted to make a business out of that and fell flat on my face, really, for a number of reasons, but I learned a lot about helping people. I learned things about bipolar that I feel are strengths and why certain people can end up with bipolar in their life. It's not always a bad thing. It's a signal or a symbol. Blah. It's a symptom of something else that is sometimes an awesome something else. Mm -hmm. But it's being projected all wrong because you don't understand what, what's going on with you and why. What ended up happening to me was I realized there was something about me that made this able to come into my life, probably you know more than one thing. And it gave me um, perspectives and an insight to life and people that, I, that allowed me to reach people in a certain way mm -hmm. that I started noticing. It took me years to see what was happening. I just knew everybody liked me. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that I was the life of the party. I got some of that in me, but... People were drawn to me for some reason, and and uh, I've had over 50 some odd jobs. I'm a, I'm a seeker, I learned, I'm called. I learn what I need to learn. I usually don't even know what that is. I just get sick of the job and I split, mm -hmm. and that's been my life forever. Mm -hmm. Whenever I left a job, I left usually a wake of, of just broken hearts behind me, of people that couldn't believe I was no longer going to be there. I say this not to, you know, not to toot my own horn, that would be gross. I, I just knew it was happening. I'm like, why are people so drawn to me? Mm -hmm. Eventually, I started being told enough that I had a way of saying things was one of the phrases that kept coming up. And then eventually I started realizing the fact that I'd, uh, I'd overcome so much. Mm -hmm. Something comes out of me that I think people pick up on that they realize I can help them. Mm -hmm. And I have people come up to me in a grocery store and tell me their, their worst story the moment we meet. So I put years together trying to figure out what that means, how I can monetize it and build a career out of it because I cannot stand being an employee. I never could. Mm -hmm. And it's got me to where I am now. And I, I had just pivoted my message on my website, actually. I don't directly help people uh, build small businesses as the main goal. Now I realize I'm this beacon of strength and hope for people to then do anything they want to do and succeed at. And in my case, building a small business is what interests me most. But I can help anybody achieve just about anything they need if they just need a strong person in their corner with some knowledge and some wisdom. That's right. where I'm at right now. I love it. So what I'm hearing is that it, it wasn't just the beard that was attracting people. You're just trying to make a good best friend for life now. The <laughs> beard is a key point of all of this. <laughs> it guides me. It tells me things. I've learned to trust it. For those uh, for those listening to the audio version yeah. of this podcast, Ken has a, a magnificent, magnificent beard. <laughs> Yes, I do. And it loves being told that. <laughs> uh, Ken, tell us about your clients. Who are your clients? Who do you work with? Okay. Right now, full disclosure, I'm at the very beginning of going pro. I help people 
uh, in my day-to-day -day life, I have a job where I work with the mentally ill and the disabled, and that's been a theme that's been recurring over the past five years. It's the first time in my life there's been a career theme. I can bounce to anything. I learned that if I can dance through the interview, I'm already smart enough to do the job. I'll, it's, it's moot. I'll figure it out later. Yeah. First time in my life, the last five years, I've been helping people. So I realize I'm where I need to be. So right now, I'm in the middle of transitioning out of a day job into full-time coaching. And the people I do coach, it's, it is people that have issues, but I make clear to them, I can't help you beat your issues other than I can show you what I did. <laughs> but I'm after people that are looking to do something that's larger than themselves. And I'm, I want to draw people to me who do not need to be repaired, then go do something grand. Because honestly, I can do it, but it ages me. <laughs> To pull someone out of the pit and bring them up to normal and save their soul, so to speak, I can do it, but cripes, it drains me, and it has nothing to do with the people. It's just not my thing. But if you say to me, let's go attack that hill and get to the top come hell or high water, I got the tools. I got your back. I'm ready to fight my way through anything it is, and I can't even sleep at night. I'm so excited. So <laughs> those are the people that I'm looking to help now, and I'm just beginning to find these people and transition into them. I love it, and and so that leads – beautifully into my next question, which is where do you get your clients and how are you marketing yourself right now? Okay. So right now the biggest job was revamping the website and the homepage for the millionth time. I don't know how many of your people have experience with trying to make the homepage represent. Well, that's like my, that's my gremlin. Very happy <laughs> with it right now. Although I got to freshen up the current video, but um, I have courses I offer and a couple of different coaching options I offer. And it took me a lot of time with everything that's going on. I, I, I lost, I lost my dad last year and he was phenomenal. He was a king to many people for all the best of reasons. He quietly was helping people in the thousands and we didn't even know. We knew, but we didn't know how big it was. Um, so my whole last year of my life has been helping my mom with that transition mm -hmm. to include massive renovations in the house and everything that that entails. And mm -hmm. in the middle, keep growing my business while doing a day job that drains me. So I've been incrementally growing to the point where I am now right on the cusp of, honestly, I'm using Justin Welsh's system to market on LinkedIn. I like everything that's about. And inside LinkedIn, I'm a writer as well. Inside LinkedIn, I am starting to find these uh, this happy group of freaks like me. They're a little ahead of me in the running, but they don't back down from just being them in a way that's completely out of the norm. And they're just saying things. I'm like, okay, so I'm in here. I have family. And I've been making friends with a lot of these people with no aim other than to make friends with these people because it's such a relief to be around people that are authentic, weird, outside the box, fighting the status quo, even within LinkedIn as they use it. It's like they're fighting LinkedIn. <laughs> I was like, this is nuts. This is me. This is a healthy me. The old me just liked to fight anything that was in charge. The end. I, that's some years ago. But uh, that's what I'm doing now. I'm going to be posting like crazy in, in LinkedIn and just making very clear in 5,000 different directions what I'm about and who I serve best. And yeah. just see what comes of it. I love it, man. Um Tell me, let's let's talk about LinkedIn a little bit more. Are you? Is this like a like a, a LinkedIn group that you found, or is just this is this is some people that you've connected with on LinkedIn? Um, I, I like I like uh, I like I like I like freaks that that remind me of myself too. <laughs> the reason LinkedIn ever even got any highlighting out of me was there was a part of me that was always afraid. I had a LinkedIn account forever. Yeah, And it was a part of me that was afraid to go make noise because I wasn't an adult yet with my business. I was like, I, I was always afraid to, to show up and be unprepared mm -hmm. and then be just like caught, so to speak. Yep. <clears throat> and at some point just recently in the last like five, six months of my development with getting crystal clear on my message and who I serve, I realized I was ready. I was like, okay, it's time to go play with the, with the adults. And I don't like what happens on a lot of the other social media sites. I'll just leave it at that. People are just, yeah, whatever. They're just there for relaxation and, and, and whatever. LinkedIn's where people, we all know we're there to do business. And mm -hmm. I love that. We don't have to hide that fact from each other or, or play some sort of marketing game. Mm -hmm. We can just talk about having business, making business. And I like that it was with, uh, you know, in general, committed people that are looking to play big at, to, to some degree. Mm -hmm. It was only later that I, that I found out there was people just like me with their own quirky set of weirdnesses that then even made it even more fun. I was like, geez, the freaks are in here. They, you, you can be a freak in LinkedIn because I'm not going to change. 
I am what I am, and I'm this way 24-7 no matter what I'm doing. I just curse less depending on the audience I'm talking to. (laughs) Um, I was telling you you before we hit record that before I even met you, I read your bio and I liked you, and and then you're just uh... (laughs) – The authenticity that's coming through, man, is 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 fantastic. I love this. Um, you're you know you're my kind of people. I love it. Keep keep doing what you're doing, brother. Um, tell me about tell me about your website. So you said you I'm I'm looking at it right now. It's bipolarexcellence.com. Um, you said you got you kind of you got the messaging down. It's something that you that you think reflects you well. Yeah. Yeah, just recently I pinned it all down. Like I got, I got to, I got to do it. I got to freshen up the video on the homepage. There's little things here and there. You know how websites are. You're always tuning them up. Sure. But I'm happy with it. I'm happy with it about 99%. And a coach I had that I treasure finding this man. I watched him mutate about four different times and just grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And that was Jason Jason Leister. And he's at sovereignbusiness.org. I'm not affiliate or nothing. I'm just happy he came into my life. Mm-hmm. And um, he told me, I was like, when I way back, like five, six years ago, I'd been at this for 15 years. And then more, if you count the pre-bipolar years, when I started trying to do something other than have a job, I asked him, I said, dude, I don't know. Are we allowed to curse on this show? Go for it, man. Absolutely. I was like, I was like, dude. All I know is when when I enter a room, everyone's drawn to me, and when I leave a job, everyone's fucking wrecked. And I don't know what the fuck I am. I just know people enjoy my presence, mm-hmm. but I don't want to be an entertainer because I thought of that. Like maybe I'm a stand up comedian. If I'm in the zone, I'm funny as shit. But it's 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 <laughs> the moment. You know, it's in the moment with the right whatever. It, you know, I can't do that, and I don't want to do that. Yeah. And he said, so when you're with people, this is when you have your greatest impact. Yeah. He goes, podcast. They got to hear you talk. Yeah. I said, OK, man. So I, I had two other podcasts. And then as I learned, I came with the one I have now, which is Bipolar Excellence Podcast. Mm-hmm. And that I'm really liking how people are receiving that. And I do. I have found a way of making clear that bipolar flavors everything. Mm hmm but I'm not here to save you from bipolar. I'm just trying to give some context to what my mind's been through and what it's ca- capable of, what I've survived, what I'm made of. You got that as a, as a buddy, so to speak, in a business sense, back in your wildest play. I dig it. So let's, let's talk more about that because you, I mean, you've got, you've got a, a varied background, former Marine, um, you know, all this stuff and, and bipolar was the, the one that you chose to focus on for, the coaching, right? Bipolar excellence. Why bipolar? What's the significance of that specifically on your coaching and 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 your the way that you coach and, and the way that you you know help entrepreneurs and so forth? Okay, so there's there's a there's a few answers there. I'll try to keep them brief. One was just that when I beat bipolar, I built the biggest soapbox ever because to come out of bipolar, it's like multiple mental illnesses in one. It's Mm-hmm. It's a train wreck of a mental illness. It has the highest suicide rate out of it. It even beats schizophrenia for suicide rates. Wow. You, 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 it's an assault. Yeah. It's, it's a very active mental illness that is hard to survive for some of us. So in the beginning, when I beat it, I thought when I started beating it, oh, I didn't even know what I'd done. I just wanted to get better. I wanted to feel less pain. That's all mm-hmm. I could hope for because that's all that made sense to me with what I knew. I ended up beating it. Then I had to be informed that I beat it and that that's an important thing. Um, that's a whole side story with a very funny writing coach I had, but bipolar became the thing. And then I learned the hard way that uh, you can't build a business out of that the way I was doing it. Mm-hmm. So I knew that bipolar was the strongest part of my entire life story. It's it's a huge thing to walk out of it. Most mm-hmm. people just have it. And they, if it doesn't take them out entirely, they just suffer with it forever. And they're told that's the, that's it. That's the answer. So mm-hmm. number one, I'm like, no, there's other answers. Not only that, there's my way. And later I found out completely different ways. Other people had beaten it. There's a whole world of help that doesn't get airtime. Yeah. And we know why that is. So why even get into it? Then partly as I started redeveloping all I did, bipolar was hammered into so many things. It was such a pain in the ass to undo the domain and try to rework, rework. I'd rework things so many times I was exhausted. So I just kept it. And I realized as well, when you're trying to coach somebody through something, it hurts them. Like, like pain is relative. There's going to be people that come to me. They already do. They There's no way they hurt the way I did when I was bipolar. 
and getting arrested and all that. But that doesn't matter when you're hurting, you're hurting and it sucks and it's horrible and you hope somebody would help. And in this case, the hurting is one of not succeeding, not reaching and attaining your life goals, hating being an employee. Mm -hmm. So I leave bipolar in place as an inspiration. I'm like, I beat that. (laughs) How hard can it be to help you build a business and keep you motivated and inspired to get over whatever your hurdles are? If you're, if you're not in that, you're that much ahead of me. And the other hand, on and, and in, in another respect, it seems like these days everybody's got a touch of something. Mm. So this gives some context to like if you are in it in a little bit. And there's a lot of plenty of successful people that are deep in the middle of something, but they found a way to be successful. And I want people to know that as well. Mm. I'm not Kanye success wise, but he's a good example. He's he's got that demon. And and there's many others. And I want to be another one of these people that'd be like, look, it's I don't have it actively. There's nothing about me that can be called bipolar. It went away almost 20 years ago, but I remember the pain and I take steps. Yeah. There's things I do to make sure it doesn't come back to bite me. And I, I want to inspire people that way and give them hope. Yeah. I think, I think one of the uh, commonalities uh, in life, I'm 43 years old. Um, and one of the, one of the things that I've seen that is, that is definitely there's, there's a common thread that runs through the most, highly empathetic people that I've met in those 43 years. The people who, 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 who care and they give a shit about what people think and, and how people feel is that they have been through the shit themselves. And, yes. that, and, that, and that gives you a respect for what it's like to be down in it, right? Yes. I, and I, I say this myself from experience. Again, you and I were talking a little bit before I hit record. When I was 19 years old, I went through clinical depression and I was cutting myself with razors and and, and I was deep in it as well. At that, at that time, um, I got through it, you know, with uh, a, a help from a little bit of medication for a while and then just a change in lifestyle um, was, was huge for me, a change, major change in lifestyle. How did you uh, beat bipolar. Okay. I might as well just (laughs) give you the nexus point of that part of the story. So I'd reached the end of, of dealing with, by with dealing with meds. Um, nothing was working. I was not anti meds. I desperately wish they made a med that helped me, but it wasn't happening. My lip, my, uh, I'm a vet, so I'm up at the VA and I'm with the head of all psychiatry. This guy's got thousands of patients mm-hmm. and all the other doctors answered to him. And he was like a textbook. I like that. He just delivered facts. He wasn't hurtful, but he didn't spare me anything. And the way my, my brain was, it, I like working with facts. It made me feel like I could do something. So he would tell me things straight out. Mm-hmm. And he told me, he said, uh, we've tried every med. And he goes, I'm not your first doctor. You've been going to doctors for years, but he's like, nothing works on you it is clear that you're only getting worse only it doesn't matter what pill we give you and he goes you and i both know we tried some things just out of desperation that were not even pertinent and mm-hmm. they didn't work he said you're a 100 meds resistant and he he said uh at the rate you're going you're going to be dead by cop in six months mm-hmm. and i said what <laughs> I said, all right, why that way? I I was used to hearing grim things. So I was like, well, why that way? He was like, come on. He goes, every time you have police contact, there's more police involved and more the Marine Corps is coming out of you. And he goes, you're just flat out dangerous at this point. They're going to have to shoot you just to survive you. And I sat with that and I was like, yeah, (laughs) yeah, you're right. I could, yeah, I agree with that summation. He was like, but uh he goes we've exhausted psychiatry as a doctor as a scientist i can pin my medical degree on the fact that we have nothing for you and you need to find something outside of psychiatry but i don't know what that is i only know psychiatry he's like drink paint if you think it'll help what's the difference and i at that point the only subscri- prescription i had was um oh clonopin i think there were 10 milligrams i had a bottle half the size of my head and the prescription said take them <laughs> Take them because the only thing that a tiny bit dented the, the really scarier parts of the illness. Yeah. So I go home with a death sentence. Oh, and he told me, he said, I feel the worst for you than anybody else. This is almost like a hint of my coaching future. I feel worse for you than any other client I have. And I said, why? And he said, you're the only one. I'm shortening this. You're the only one that after I give you the pill, you come back with a list of questions. Why that pill? What's it doing with the other pills? What's the prognosis? 
he goes, you have all these questions. He goes, nobody else asks anything. They just take the pill. I'm like, you're kidding me. They take all these chemicals and shit and don't ask you what's going in or why. He goes, none, none. You're the only one. And he said, and because of that, you are crystal clear on how fucked you are. He goes, I wish you didn't know what you knew so you could die in ignorant bliss. Mm -hmm. And I was like, all right, I got the facts. So I go home. I'm sitting at my my uh, sitting in my basement, my parents' basement, and I'm like, I'm gonna die. And I wasn't scared so much as just depressed about it. And at that point in my life, all I felt was fear, despair, and rage. Those were the only three things I could detect as, that you could call emotion. I mm. couldn't feel the energy of people in life anymore. I wasn't always sure what was 100% real. I knew the floor was the floor, but I wasn't clear on its purpose. Shit like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, I'm gonna fucking die. Holy shit, this is bleak. And I sat with that and I heard this tiny, tiny voice in the back of my head. It was the Marine part of me whispering. <laughs> it was like, this is not the way a fucking Marine goes out. Do something, fight. And, and I didn't feel anything like in the movies. You know, I just said, fine, fuck it. I'll fight. It was two years before I even felt better. But from that moment, I just I started researching stuff. A magazine came, Discover Magazine, Science. I don't know anything about science. It just interested me. On the cover of the magazine happened to be uh, nutrition. Can it cure mental illness? And I was like, holy shit. First thought, Discover Magazine cannot risk their reputation on this as a cover story. There has to be something to this. I dig into the story. Company out of Canada called True Hope. They're still there. Everything they said about nutrients matched what I learned about bodybuilding and making the body perform. Mm -hmm. So I could get behind that part of the science because that I was very familiar with. And then uh, I added some other nutrients for particular reasons. And basically I address, I was a lot of times I was a mechanic, a very skilled mechanic on high tech stuff. I started fixing my body the way I troubleshoot a machine and, and I started getting better. It took, it took four or five months before I could tell anything was improving. Then as the body started getting better, one day I remember looking in the mirror and pointing at my reflection. I'm like, I think the rest is something to do with you. <laughs> so then I started looking into the software, found a very particular kind of software from a company called Centerpoint, uh, ends in an RE, changed the, the guy that invented that, what he had to say about the mind and life and everything. It, it was staggering. Changed my life just reading what he had to say. Mm -hmm. I used his product and there was a definite improvement. And then over time, I actually, it, about maybe within four or five years after all of this, this was, a, this was like a three, two, three year period. And then four or five years later, I wasn't even doing all the things I did anymore to stay well. Um, I had learned how to cope many, uh, a panic. Panic has been the only lingering thing. And I can count if it happens one or two times a year. Mm -hmm. And I know how to cope with it now. Mm -hmm. And it just cruises through me. It's a momentary thing. I can have it happen right in, fr in front of you and you won't know I'm dealing with it. And it passes because I learned some coping skills for that. But mm -hmm. I also learned people just have fucking panic attacks. It doesn't mean you got a mental illness. There's many <laughs> reasons for a panic attack. And that's all I got. And it's once a year or two. So um, that's how that that's how that story went. And because uh, I was scared, I ran out of money at one point to stop taking the supplements I was taking. And I asked the company, am I going to go insane? So yeah. months down the road, they're like, we honestly don't know. But call us, you know, stay in touch because they work with you very closely. Yeah. And nothing happened. Wow. That's a hell of a story. It was it was brutal. It was, uh, like I said, I've been dead. I drank too much once as a youth, and that was really just a mindless. I had way too much access to a mountain, like a literal mountain of alcohol. And I drank myself into a coma at 15. And then when I was in my 20s, that's when I got wasted because at this point, alcohol was the only thing that took the pain away from bipolar. But then the alcoholic crap would kick in and the Marine Corps would come out in all its ugliness. And one night in a fit of rage, I ate a whole bottle of lithium, a month's supply. Just kind of like, fuck everything. Not suicide. It was it was a rage-fueled thing. Sure. I died. I died multiple times on the way to the ER. In the ER, I died multiple times. And then at one point, they called it. And they had to come out to my poor family and, and tell them he's gone. 
We did everything we could. And then in the back, like in a movie, boom, I do one of those. And they go running back in and keep working on me. And then it turns out some experimental goo they were pumping into me for $1,000 a vial, like every two hours, absorbs lithium. They had just invented it. And they tried it on me and it sucked all the lithium. It was like, you know, uh, what do they call it? Chelation, collation. They sucked it. It sucked all the lithium out. And I just hung in there long enough because I refused to die. And I lived. And two weeks later, I woke up. And this, I'll oh. throw this in and then I'll let you go talk to me. But when I woke up. <laughs> The first thing I saw was my dad sitting there in a chair. I didn't know I'd been out for two weeks. He's grinning. He's got some tears in his eyes. He's he's army truck driver, blue collar, very nice, but doesn't not in touch with the motion so much. Tears running down his face. And he looked at me and he was like, huh, I'll give you this much. You're hard to kill. And then we busted up laughing. And that's when I knew my dad still had my back. <laughs> Jesus. And then I just, you know, I, I still was sick for about three more years after that. But then I then I found what I found and got better. Yeah, that's crazy, man. Well, yeah, it's, you know, it's good to it's good to be on the other side of that, I'm sure. Oh, it's it's a blessing. Every once in a while, I'll, I'll just let myself just I don't know. I don't know if you call it like like when you look at a car wreck, you can't tear away. I'll look at my pasture for a minute and try to really feel it. Just, just, I don't know, just to increase my appreciation, just once in a blue moon, my cripes, I am glad I'm not back. I'd have given it back then. I'd have murdered someone. If you said, if you kill that person, this will stop happening. I'd have killed yeah. somebody. It hurts so bad. And it was so terrifying. Does it ever feel like, you know, maybe I'm projecting here. For me, when I look back on, on those times in my life, man, it almost feels like I'm watching someone else in a movie through, you know, through a, a window pane that's, that's kind of dusty and blurry and you can't quite like, it's just, it's so far removed from my reality today because I'm on this, on the other side of it. It just, it's, it's very strange to look back and think that that was once me. Yeah. I, in one part, my life has been one filled with such extremes. I'm 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 not really worked up over these things, but I am amazed that I pulled through when I was in it. And I I think this has more to. You know, I'm not a I'm not a doctor or anything. I know what I know or, or feel or think what I think. But I believe with the depression part of it, I went through a very strong period where number one, I mean, you might relate to this. I hated all happy people. I absolutely hated happy people. Sure. Yep. And and then um uh I called them normal people. I hated normal people. Yeah. Well if they were laughing and whatnot, they really had to go. They had to be dealt yeah. with. <laughs> I didn't do anything, but God, I hated them. And then you don't know this, and I'll bet you know this one too. You don't know that there is an energy and a connection to life and people that can be taken away from you. You you don't know you have it until it's been taken away from you. Mm -hmm. There is something that people feel when they're talking to each other. And just in life around you, you're used to it. You've always had it. But when you get twisted up like we did, it can go away. And it is so lonely. You don't feel connected to anything. I used to tell people, it's like I'm watching. You're all on a TV. And I can't touch the TV and feel like I'm with you. You're a show I'm witnessing. I'm not in any of this. And it is terrifyingly lonely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, this is a great conversation, man. We're getting a little off track, but this is, I, I love, I love this kind of stuff. Um, thank you for, you know, being vulnerable and, and sharing that with us. Circling back to the coaching stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to make sure that we, 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 we are able to highlight again, you know, some of the coaching work that you do. What does a typical engagement with you look like, um, when you're working with a client? Well, what I'm about to, what I'm about to put in place is uh, some asynchronous coaching, which is like texting. Mm -hmm. You leave me a video. I do a video sure. reply. Then we don't have to meet schedules Sure. with, with uh, whatever agreed upon actual live calls. Cause you got to do that every couple of weeks or so. And uh, when I'm talking to people, let's say on the live call, I just listen. I just listen for openings. I listen for keywords, whatever they're saying. I've learned uh, through my own stuff. I learned a lot of times what people think they want isn't even really what they want. And if you keep digging deeper, you'll find out what the real thing is that's driving them that even made them ask that question. And if you can pin that down and help them discover what, what's really driving it, they'll re they'll get their, they'll have moments, moments of awakening. And that is so fun to do when somebody 
gets it. I'm coaching a guy right now who's put, believe this or not, you know, the little bit, you know, of me, he's building a Christian jam band <laughs> and I've been teaching him about, and yeah, I got a, a big filter from my end when I'm working with him and he's great and he knows how I am, but you know, you, you, you tailor your presence to your, your person. For sure. He's great. And uh, I, I've told him, I've been teaching him about marketing online and what it takes to find people. And this is all brand new to him. He's older. He's in his sixties. And he first, everything was, was, was unknown to him. And then he was scared of it and he didn't think he could do anything. I've got him through those hurdles. And then uh, he's, he's got to the point where he's getting mad about results, but in the sense that he demands more of himself that wasn't there when we started and he now he's starting to see where other people fail in their marketing because he needs to reach them and he can't. And he's like, well, who does that? How come I can't? And I was like, do you remember when I told you two months ago that you needed to build one of these things? You're in it now from the, do you see? And you're, you're now you're the recipient. He's like, oh, I'm like, well, now you get it, man. And recently he had two different, he wants to make the jam band a hobby and he wants to be a music producer. And he doesn't want to make money with the jam band, but he wants to make money. He's all conflicted. I said, dude, you're, you're, you're asking the universe for two separate things. It's not going to happen. You're just going to confuse everybody. I said, you need to build a jam band for your passion. Mm -hmm. Learn how to be a music producer while doing it. Then mm -hmm. go do that for someone else separate of the jam band. Now you have your cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. And that, that took me a couple months to make that realization of talking to him. And that was a huge awakening for him. Like now you can do both without upsetting either camp. Mm -hmm. Nice. Nice. Um, so you're, I mean, you're, you're, you just said you're, you're kind of, you're in the process right now of really breaking out and, and kind of taking this and going pro. What kind of struggles are you running into in, in making that transition and how are you overcoming those? Okay, so, you know, limited budget's always been a thing, as with all of us that are bootstrapping, if that's sure. where you're at. I am the king of reverse engineering. I learned how to read source code on a web page and taught myself web design the hard way that way. Mm -hmm. And I've just been exposed. If you expose yourself to enough, you start seeing trends and habits and patterns and why anything's built the way it is. Mm -hmm. And if you're patient and persistent, you can find enough free stuff to cob together to make something that performs sometimes better, but at least close enough without having to spend any money or too much. So technology had been, had been one, but I'm, I've been breaching that easily lately. Um, getting the message correct. Uh, you know, like in my case, bipolar is the, the key, but I do not want to draw bipolar people to me who want to be saved from bipolar. I am not your person for that. You don't even want me to try. It's an incorrect fit. Mm -hmm. but yet it's the most powerful part of my story. So that was where the biggest hurdle was, you know, you, a lot of your fight is inside your own mind. It's you against you trying to get clear on things mm -hmm. and everybody sounds right. I learned that you, you learn that everybody sounds right. Cause everyone is right. If that bit of information fits at that time, for whatever reason, they're, they're not wrong, but mm -hmm. now it becomes one of discernment. Is this right for me right now? So I've learned to say no to a lot of things. And the other thing was confidence in person. I, I don't want to get too much. I have no issues with confidence in person for any reason under the sun, put it that way. Mm -hmm. Coming online and having, have my material represent me. Well, now, now, now I'm a scared little girl and I've got problems and somebody needs to help me with this. This is terrifying. Trolls are going to come at me and I can't tolerate the fact that I can't go visit them at their house. And like, why'd you say that? You thought I wasn't going to show up that kind of thing. <laughs> getting their face yeah yeah like in one of the clerks movies with, with jay when jay and silent bob were visiting houses so recently yep. i put my show on youtube i was terrified to go on youtube up until two months ago terrified because i don't have it i did not have it in me to be to 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 deal with trolls in an adult fashion and not let it affect me mm -hmm. but in the last couple months so much has been going on so well i said i i i it just went away. The fear went away. I don't care. I don't care what they say. I listen to a lot of Mark Maron on what the fuck pod. I like his style and how he talks to people. And he, he goes through his problems. He's world famous and one of the best people at podcasting. And he still has issues that I'm dealing with now. Mm -hmm. And um, that's about it for really major problems. I've been overcoming them left and right lately and really finding my sweet spots. And it, there's a feeling that has settled in me 
it's funny. I wanted to get out of work, out of being an employee my entire adult life. And I'm almost 55. Mm -hmm. But as I built all this, I wanted that feeling that you have as an employee when there's no mystery about how you earn the paycheck. You go to work, you do the thing. There's a check at the end of the week. I wanted to feel that way about this thing I've built. And I now feel that way. Nice. It feels really good. There's a calm. I've known for years, I got this. I don't know how damn long it's going to take to, to, for the cash to roll in and me just have the life I want, but I'm not worried about it. And then just in the last few months, a calm settled upon me. It's like, no, I've studied enough people ahead of me who are successful. I'm where they are. I, this is about to pop. I don't even, I'm not even worried about it anymore. It, God, that feels good. It feels so good. Nice. To not worry or even, you know, you get annoyed. Of course you get annoyed. You want it now. But I, I'm not, I'm not attached to that anymore. Now, now it's mastery. Uh -huh. Am I doing the best way I can and serving anyone that comes to me for any reason the best way I can? The money comes. That's great, man. I want to, and, and, and I think I want to take that idea and circle back to what we were talking before about your, your marketing and your writing and, and going to be posting on LinkedIn a whole bunch. I would strongly recommend as you know at boxer we we do marketing for coaches this is what we do i would strongly recommend for someone like you to do videos and and post videos on linkedin a whole bunch like do do oh, i'm gonna i'm gonna yeah yeah do like do like three a day man because no. you've got you've got your you've got a vibe that is that is uniquely ken jensen right there's i i talk to i don't know a dozen coaches two dozen coaches a week. Um, I talked to a lot of coaches and consultants and, and thought leaders and you've got, you've got a vibe. And I think that's um, going to be a unique selling point for you and for your, for your coaching. And uh, man, if you can get, if you can get videos out there, you're going to find people that vibe with your message. Um, and the people that don't vibe with your message are going to be turned off from it. And that's great because then you're not going to have to have those sales calls with people who are not going to buy anyway. Yep. Right. It, you're, you're qualifying your, your leads right out of the gate by doing, by doing video. Um, and, and you're talking about leading with value and how you can help people, right? That's what you use those videos for is think about like what kind of, what kind of questions, um, can you answer? in those videos? What kind of problems can you solve upfront for free that's going to get people to know you, get people to like you, and then when they come to a point in their, in their life, in their professional career, where they're thinking to themselves, gosh, I could use a coach. That motherfucker Ken Jensen. <laughs> That's, I think that's exactly the statement I want them to say because I've yeah. used that. I've used that on people. Yeah, I, and and I've already got. I I, uh, I have a membership to Buffer, which I'm gonna load with written and video and audio. And and oh. like you, you just caught me when the whole marketing machine is about to be filled and turned on. I got on YouTube two months ago with a system that takes an audio. It does something to it so a video presents, but it's really just an oh. audio of the podcast. And, and that's great. And that, that got me through that fear factor, really. Oh. And then I learned how it did it, reverse engineered it. Now I figured out how I can get rid of that system. I don't need it now. I saw what it did. I'm like, oh, I could do that. I just, I was too busy. I couldn't figure out the front end. Now, now I see what they did. I got this. I don't need them anymore. And then uh, video is huge because, yeah, it's, I know my impact on people and I definitely don't want to work with the wrong ones. And yep. that's something I learned from uh, Mr. Jason Leister. He's like, you want to do everything you can in your power to piss off the people that are not your people. Totally. It's not even personal. It's your totally. filtering so that you can enjoy your life. Totally. A perfect fit. And you have the life you want and you end up surrounded with people you dig the hell out of to boot business aside. I love that, man. That, yeah, that that's fantastic advice. Follow that always. <laughs> that, <laughs> Thanks, Michael. That's that's fantastic. Uh, Ken, what uh, what three books would you recommend all your clients read? The first one I remember that really changed my life was Rich Dad Poor Dad, and it's why you should not have a job and why you should own a business, separate from whatever else he says in it. Just that one thing, he makes it clear why you should own a business and what that even actually means and how it differs from self-employment. Mm -hmm. Oh, Christ, you caught me off guard. Three books. <laughs> um, I am such a huge book reader. Who else have I read that really changed the whole 
everything. That was really the only one other than that. There's a lot of books have had an impact on me, but I prefer bios. I like reading bios from people who have done stuff. Okay. Give me some for biographies. Example, Let's do it. Let me, yeah. Let me, let me pivot off of books for a second. You want your mind blown? I'm a metalhead. I'm huh? a chore, <laughs> but I am a metalhead. I grew up in, I grew up in the eighties, caught all the shows. You got to find the documentary twisted fucking sister. See what they're not even a good band, but they have a devout following. What they went through to reach the top is is Greek tragedy epic, and yeah. they just kept going. Yeah. Except for the music, you D should watch that. D Snyder, D Snyder's a machine, man. I love him. I love him. Yeah. Yep. And uh, Cripes, there's just so many bios I read. Anything Arnold wrote. I wanted to be Arnold for the longest time because I grew up in the era of Arnold. He's the one that got me into lifting. Uh, now I just follow him loosely to just uh, just for inspiration because he's another machine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. it's hard for me to pick books because I'm, I'm looking to my right. I got a stack of 50 books I read just in the last six months, and there's 20 waiting in the wings. It's it's hard to remember what even – but Rich Dad, Poor Dad, That's put it this way. That's the one I gave to my kid. He won't read it. At 18 <laughs> – <laughs> he's achieving in epic ways in his style and yeah. i love it and he knows what i'm doing and he digs it and and i'm letting him do his own thing because he's he's incredible but i gave him that book rich dad poor dad because i said you need to know why the 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 rat race is a death trap uh -huh. i need to know that you know why you shouldn't be employed forever unless it absolutely ticks every box in your life for what you want to do to live a passionate life. You can have a job like that, but damn, they're awful limited. And most mm -hmm. people don't have that. They just, I would just say that one, just so yeah. people get really clear on why they, one of the biggest things about me besides number one, become aware, become aware of what you're not aware of and your life will change. And two, <laughs> this is even bigger, either during or after you become aware take responsibility for every single fucking aspect of your life you you cannot control everything but you 100 percent control your reaction and that's how you shape your life and have a better life than everyone around you or just, just a fulfilling life okay mm -hmm. so book where did i get that from in part a uh, man's search for meaning victor frankel oh there you go that was so that's this uh this is another one that was mentioned in the last the podcast that I did yesterday with that uh, guy who was an MMA fighter that I was telling you about. Okay. He also we were, we talked about man's search for meaning there as well. I mean that's uh, I mean how can you not mention that book? It's such a such a classic. Yep. <clears throat> awesome. Um, you have got a free course. It takes guts to live well. You want to tell us a little bit about no, that? No, that just, that just pivoted. That That's back under the paid realm, which I said on my podcast a million gotcha. times, just so people aren't surprised. Um, so the system that I created to beat bipolar, it, yeah. it's, it's comprehensive. It's got videos, written material, action steps, links to all the third parties that I recommend that I, that I used to get well. So that's in my courses. If you go to BipolarExcellence.com, it's one of the courses. I have a course that's really just all the resources I've used from the past up till now that really make my machine go and make my life go. Mm -hmm. And then I have a You Do You course, which is kind of like how you feel about me. It's my way of teaching people to embrace that. Mm -hmm. the, the world, I, I feel, we all know, anybody with any sense knows the world's going through a rapid change on all fronts. All the old systems are dying. And it just is. Forget how you feel about anything. It just is. And what I learned was, uh, it, I think it came from the Depression era. There's money to be made when there's blood in the streets. That mm -hmm. applies to money, but it also applies to any project you're trying to achieve. When the system is unstable, that's when a lunatic like me doesn't have quite so many eyes on them. <laughs> and other people are looking for an oddball answer, and we yeah. meet. Right now, I feel is the greatest time to attempt to pull off whatever you want to attempt with your life, because I think maybe all of a couple of years from now, it's not going to be as easy to pull off now while everything, nobody's keeping a close eye on anything. You can make a move. Mm -hmm. You would have met resistance from whatever the status quo is. Yeah. The status quo is busy trying to save its own life right now. Now is the time to make moves. Yeah. I love it, man. Um. Ken, I want to be respond. I want to be respectful of your time, and we're coming up on the end of the hour here. Is there anything that you would like to talk about that we have not yet had an opportunity to touch upon? 
um, just don't, if, if you're listening, if you're listening, there's a reason. S stop kidding yourself. If you're not already successful or trying to be, you heard me and Michael for a reason. That's your heart, the universe, your soul, what, whatever makes you comfortable, whatever you believe in, something pushed you here. It's time for you to make a move and just know. I mean, listen to my story. Michael's got his. We shouldn't even be here. <laughs> and we're here <laughs> trying to help you. You can overcome anything if you just decide it. It's just a decision you make. And then you find someone like me or Michael to help you. And now's the time to do it. I, I just I want people to know they they not only should do this, they can. Yeah. Yeah. If you made it this far in the podcast, come on, people. <laughs> yeah, really. Come on. What are you, what are you doing? Get it done. Get it done. Awesome. Um, Ken Jensen, where, where can people find you online? Where can our listeners and viewers find you online? Go to www.bipolarexcellence.com. Everything stems from that. Please get on my newsletter so we can do the thing. You'll leave, if you hate me, you'll leave. If you love me, we stay in touch. You know how these things work. But bipolarexcellence.com, that's my entire world, and it is growing fast. Awesome. And uh, next week, I need to meet you. We'll also make sure to include, well, well, we'll include that link and as well as the link to your LinkedIn uh, on our show notes page because you're going to start blowing up your LinkedIn. So make sure to connect with Ken on LinkedIn as well. Um, Ken, brother, thank you so much. This has been awesome. I want to thank you again as well. Uh, our viewers and listeners don't know this, but Ken and I were supposed to record last week um, and Ken was kind enough to allow me to reschedule so that I could go to the to the to the library with my 15 month old daughter so ken thank you again for that that was awesome of you um and thank you for making time to chat with me today i appreciate it man you're most welcome my kid's the size of a mac truck now and i miss when he was 40 pounds and looking at me like i was god so i could not deny you that <laughs> thank you very opal, much Michael. opal my baby girl she's not even 40 pounds yet i think she she maybe is pushing 30 well we'll see <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, thank you. And thank you as always to our viewers and listeners. You guys are awesome. Uh, the show is nothing without you. So your attention is, is worth everything to us. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this, to watch this, please. If you know someone that you think would benefit from this message, share this with them, share this podcast with them, give us a like, give us a share, subscribe, do all the things that you're supposed to do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, thank you so much. We'll talk to you guys next time. Take care. Thanks, Michael. See you, everybody.